This audio production was made in collaboration with Audible Anarchist. Chapter 2. Radical Currents and the Workers' Movement Introduction This chapter will introduce three radical currents from the historical workers' movement. First, we will look at anarchism, the name given to the anti-state socialists in the European workers' movement of the 19th and 20th centuries. Anarchism, as a political doctrine, opposed itself to all statist politics, whether parliamentary or revolutionary, instead placing its emphasis on human capacities for voluntary cooperation, mutual aid, and working-class direct action. Second, we will encounter syndicalism. Emerging in France, the syndicalist movement of rank-and-file-controlled radical unions spread to many countries taking new forms in different conditions. We will focus on the French CGT, the North American IWW, and the syndicalist currents in the workers' movement in Britain. In all cases, working-class direct action was the watchword of the syndicalists who, often under anarchist influence, formed unions based on the shared economic interests of workers. Finally, we will look at council communism, a radical Marxist current which broke with orthodoxies such as the necessity of the party and the capture of state power. The Council Communists drew some very similar conclusions to many anarchists and anarcho-syndicalists, but we will also explore some important differences. Socialism without the state. Anarchism. Anarchism has its origins in the working class and socialist movements of Europe in the 19th century. It was a major force in the First International, an alliance of socialist organizations and unions which existed between 1864 and 1876. When that organization split between pro-state socialists, who became known as Marxists and associated with the color red, and anti-state socialists, who became known as anarchists and associated with the color black, the German statesman Otto von Bismarck remarked that, quote, crowned heads, wealth, and privilege may well tremble should ever again the black and red unite, end quote. Anarchism, covering all the anti-state socialists, took numerous forms. It is often said the three main currents are mutualism, associated with Pierre-Joseph Proudhon, collectivism, associated with Mikhail Bakunin, and communism, associated with Eric Malatesta and Peter Kropotkin. In reality, there was considerable overlap in evolution as ideas developed in conjunction with the movement. The ideas of mutualism, a self-managed market economy, probably had the greatest influence on the cooperative movement. Anarchist collectivism proposed expropriation of private property to be owned communally and operated under worker self-management, with money abolished and replaced by some form of labor notes, essentially IOUs for work done. Collectivism was a significant influence on Spanish anarcho-syndicalism in the 1920s and 30s, although its modern influence has waned. The third school, that to which the anarcho-syndicalist IWA belongs, is anarchist or libertarian communism. The origins of anarchist communism are most often credited to the anarchist prince, Peter Kropotkin, although he was largely taking up and elaborating ideas that originated in the Italian section of the First International. Like collectivism, Anarchist communism is for worker self-management and the abolition of private property, but goes further in advocating the abolition of market exchange and money to be replaced by production and distribution according to the principle of from each according to ability to each according to needs. In all its incarnations, anarchism was never simply anti-state, but has always been the anti-state wing of the socialist movement. Anarchist collectivism was firmly in the camp of the class struggle, as its leading proponent Mikhail Bakunin was a prominent member of the First International, and had a great influence on the more libertarian sections, which later fed into the development of anarcho-syndicalism. In the case of anarchist communism, however, there is sometimes less emphasis on the class struggle and more on the human capacity for mutual aid and voluntary cooperation, which Kropotkin had set out at length as an important factor of evolution. Thus, anarchist communism often had a more humanist bent, and the tradition put varying emphasis on the class struggle as either a progressive or regressive force. Quote, the theoreticians of anarcho-communism, Peter Kropotkin, Eric Malatesta, and others, maintained that the roots of social development lie in progress of the ethical concepts of humanity, that capitalism is a regressive system since it undermines the intrinsic social nature of humanity based on mutual aid and that the division of humanity into warring classes plays a reactionary role, retarding the self-realization of the human personality." End quote. For this reason, early anarchist communism did not focus primarily on the labor movement. In 1907, there was an important debate between Pierre Monat and Eric Malatesta at the International Anarchist Congress in Amsterdam. Monat argued for a neutral syndicalism that was not political and not even anarchist on the grounds that workers' economic conditions gave them identical interests, 
so that political, quote, differences of opinion, often subtle and artificial, fall into the background in the syndicate, enabling agreement, end quote. In contrast, Malatesta had argued that, quote, the basic error of Monat, and of all revolutionary syndicalists, in my opinion, derives from an overly simplistic conception of class struggle. It is a conception whereby the economic interests of all workers, the working class, are held to be equal. The reality is very different, in my view. There are therefore no classes, in the proper sense of the term, because there are no class interests. There exists competition and struggle within the working class, just as there does amongst the bourgeoisie." End quote. Monat and Malatesta agreed that syndicalism was an economic movement, but for Malatesta this wasn't sufficient, and must be supplemented by separate anarchist political organizations. This separation was most clearly articulated in his 1925 article, Syndicalism and Anarchism. In it, he makes the case for syndicalist unions which unite all workers on an economic basis, and separate political anarchist organizations of varying kinds, which operate both inside and outside the unions. Malatesta by no means denied the importance of the labor movement. On the contrary, he insisted that, quote, everyone, or almost everyone, is in agreement on the usefulness and the need for the anarchists to take an active part in the labor movement and to be its supporters and promoters, end quote. Syndicalist unions, he argued, were often founded on anarchist principles. However, they either proved ineffective and thus remained small, barely functioning as unions at all, or they won their initial battles and these victories attracted more workers into their ranks, which enabled them to win more battles and attract more workers, and so on. The problem with this, Malatesta diagnosed, was that there was no reason to think these workers, who were attracted by the union success and winning gains for workers, shared the anarchist principles upon which the union was founded. Quote, for a union to serve its own ends, and at the same time act as a means of education and ground for propaganda aimed at radical social change, it needs to gather together all workers, or at least those workers who look to an improvement of their conditions, and to be able to put up some resistance to the bosses. Can it possibly wait for all the workers to become anarchists before inviting them to organize themselves and before admitting them into the organization? End quote. Thus he held that, quote, Cynicalism, by which I mean the practical variety and not the theoretical sort, which everyone tailors to their own shape, is by nature reformist, end quote, and that, quote, pure anarchism cannot be a practical solution while people are forced to deal with bosses and with authority, end quote. For that reason, he argued for a separation of the necessarily reformist, economic, syndicalist unions from the various political anarchist organizations, which should propagandize revolutionary anarchist ideas within them. For Malatesta, the role of anarchists was not to make the unions more anarchist, but to argue within them for anarchist tactics while keeping them open to all workers who wanted to fight to improve their conditions, regardless of political affiliation. Meanwhile, the anarchists should also fight within the union to keep it neutral from political parties. Quote, If the survival of the organization and the needs and wishes of the organized make it really necessary to compromise and enter into muddled negotiations with authority and the employers, so be it. But let it be the responsibility of others, not the anarchists. End quote. For Malatesta, therefore, any concession or negotiation under capitalism was reformist, and so it was important for anarchists to remain pure, leaving this dirty business to others. This approach would become known as dual organizationalism, a current of anarchism that holds that mass class organizations such as unions need a specific political organization operating within them. But not all dual organizationalists think alike. While Malatesta saw the role of anarchists as keeping themselves pure on political lines and keeping unions organized along economic lines, independent of political ideas, others sought to use political organizations as a means to politicize economic associations, to anarchize syndicalist unions. This brings us to the organizational platform of the libertarian communists. This text was published in 1926 by the Diello Truda Group, who are anarchists in exile after the Communist Party consolidation of power in the young and misnamed Soviet Union. Drawing on their experiences of the struggle against both capitalism and Bolshevism, they set out a template for anarchist organizations which remains influential among anarchists today. First of all, the platform firmly espouses anarchist communism as its goal and situates this firmly within the class struggle. The document outlines the necessity for violent social revolution and the anarchist opposition to all states, including democratic ones. In terms of their attitude to unions, syndicalist and mainstream, the platform argues that they can have no ideology of their own, and therefore any union, quote, always reflects the ideologies of a range of political groupings, notably of those most intensively at work within its ranks, end quote. 
The necessity is therefore for anarchists to organize themselves politically and work intensely both inside the unions to anarchize them and outside them to exert a similar influence in other spheres. Thus, the platform is supportive of anarcho-syndicalism as a step forward, but argues that syndicalist unions only become or remain anarcho-syndicalist because of the vigorous political organization of anarchists within their ranks to keep them that way, and, quote, to prevent any slide towards opportunism, end quote. Thus, platformists, as those influenced by the platform are colloquially known, are also dual organizationalists. But rather than keeping the economic organization apolitical, the task of a political organization is to politicize it with anarchism. There are four famous organizational principles set out to define the basis of the political organization which should carry out this task. Theoretical unity, tactical unity, collective responsibility, and federalism. The platform wagers that thusly organized, anarchists will be able to out-organize state socialist parties within the trade unions, Soviets and other organs of the working class, and so ensure the working class movement develops in an anarchist direction and the revolution develops in the direction of libertarian communism and not state socialism. The advocacy of a tight, unified, and disciplined political organization reminded many anarchists at the time of a political party, and the authors of the platform were labeled anarcho-Bolshevik in some quarters. This criticism strikes us as unfair. If one wants to organize an anarchist political organization, the principles set out in the platform make perfect sense in terms of combining unity of action with internal democracy, and thus combining effective political organization with anarchist principles. From an anarcho-syndicalist point of view, the problems lie elsewhere. For instance, in the next section we will see how the slide of certain syndicalist unions into reformism was not because of the lack of political organization within their ranks, but rather a function of the very apolitical nature the platform affirms. Thus, platformists can also be anarcho-syndicalists, but anarcho-syndicalists are not necessarily platformists. Certainly, to anarcho-syndicalist eyes, the platform places too much emphasis on the ability of political organizations to combat the material contradictions which arise from unions organizing under capitalism, principally the development and domination of representative function over the associational one. As anarcho-syndicalists, we of course believe these contradictions can be successfully navigated in a way consistent with our revolutionary principles. But before we can elaborate, we must first examine some of these contradictions in the case of syndicalism from which anarcho-syndicalism has evolved. Unions without bureaucrats. Syndicalism. The workers' movement in France had faced severe repression in the aftermath of the 1871 Paris Commune. Radical tendencies were forced underground, and it was in this period that the stereotype of the anarchist bomb thrower emerged, as some anarchists turned away from the labor movement towards propaganda by the deed, assassinations and bombings against the rich. However, by the late 19th century, there was something of a regrouping of the workers' movement with the development of an anarchist-influenced form of trade unionism, revolutionary syndicalism. Rudolf Rocker writes that this tendency, quote, developed quite spontaneously within the French working class as a reaction against political socialism, the cleavages in which for a long time permitted no unified trade union movement, end quote. This movement had its origins in a coming together of existing unions and the Bousse du Travail, mutual aid schemes including job placement, unemployment benefits, relocation aid, and the aid of those injured on the job, as well as cultural, educational, and propaganda services, and some of the union functions of organizing strikes. Anarchist involvement was significant in the Bousses, and, as Rocker notes, the anarchist message of class unity gained popularity in the face of a political socialist movement wrought with sectarian divisions. French revolutionary syndicalism proposed this unity be brought about through a general union for workers. That union was the CGT, General Confederation of Labor, founded in 1895. In its early days, the union was under heavy anarchist influence, and elected a series of anarchist and non-party socialist general secretaries Paul Mason writes that, quote, In the space of a decade, Griffelhus had created a superbly effective form of trade unionism. With minimal dues paying and bureaucracy, the militant workers could, every so often, unleash a lean, mean, striking machine. What is more, they did it not just in an atmosphere of repression, but of stolid refusal to negotiate. Only in the years 1905 and 1906 did the number of strikes ended by negotiation rise above 10%. Nine out of ten strikes finished without any formal contract across the table. Either you lost and went back to work, or, as with Haviland, the boss opened the factory gates and upped the wages. 60% ended this way, with victory to the unions." End quote. By its very nature as a general union, the CGT was open to all workers, 
Consequently, quote, the CGT was not composed exclusively of revolutionary trade unions, certainly half of its members were of reformist tendency, and had only joined the CGT because they recognized that the dependence of the trade unions on the political parties was a misfortune for the movement, end quote. If we ask why reformists were relatively weak, we need only note the ruling class's preference for repression and refusal to negotiate, which limited the space for reformist unionism and class collaboration. Social partnerships takes two, and the bosses weren't playing, at first, at least. As a result, revolutionary ideas held great sway within the ranks of the CGT. These were most clearly articulated in the Charter of Amin in 1906, and in the writings of its leading theoretician, Emile Pouget, to which we will return in the following chapter. The Amin Charter was a clear statement of the CGT's revolutionary syndicalism. The Charter espoused a revolutionary program, but also enshrined political neutrality, understood as standing outside all political schools and parties, but not opposed to them, leaving political party allegiance, or lack of, to the conscience of individual members. Quote, the Charter served to minimize political dissension in the unions, which were to focus attention exclusively on the economic struggle. End quote. Against the political parties, the CGT defined itself as an economic organization which grouped, quote, together all workers conscious of the fight to be carried out for the disappearance of wage labor and of employers, end quote. In doing so, it made the revolutionary and revolutionary syndicalism a matter of internal democracy. So long as revolutionaries formed a majority, the union espoused a revolutionary perspective and pursued uncompromising class conflict and social change via direct action methods. But in the early 20th century, bosses in the state began to react to the gains of the CGT with a more conciliatory attitude. This increased the space for reformists to operate, as class collaboration could be seen to bear fruit. By 1909, the growth of the union had put the revolutionaries in the minority. The CGT grew from 100,000 members in 1902 to 700,000 in 1912, out of a population of 7 million. Victor Griffel Hiss resigned as general secretary amidst machinations against him, and Emile Pouget left the union, disillusioned. The slide into class collaboration, reformism, and bureaucratization was crowned by the CGT's support for the national war effort in 1914. This was the most decisive break with its revolutionary internationalist origins. Although revolutionaries remained inside the CGT to try and pursue an anti-militarist agenda, Following the First World War, it increasingly fell under the sway of political parties, leading to a series of splits as revolutionaries and others left the organization. The CGT still exists today, and even maintains elements of the Amin Charter in the constitution of many of its member unions. But in practice, it has become almost indistinguishable from other modern trade union federations, with all the pitfalls that implies. As the CGT grew, syndicalist ideas were also taking root amongst the working class in North America. The IWW was founded in 1905 amidst violent class conflict. Quote, Few strikes took place without loss of life. The resulting bitterness had much made the prospect of fundamental change appealing to most workers. End quote. Much like the CGT, it espoused a revolutionary intent and oriented itself to the whole working class, not just particular crafts or trades. They called this model industrial unionism, where all the workers in one industry, whatever their job, belong to the same industrial union, and in turn, these industrial unions all belong to the one big union of the IWW. At the time, only a minority of workers were organized, and the IWW set out to organize the unorganized. From its beginning, the IWW was also a racially mixed union at a time of widespread segregation. Big Bill Haywood issued a statement of intent at the founding conference declaring that, quote, we are here today to confederate the workers into a working class movement that shall have for its purpose the emancipation of the working class from the slave bondage of capitalism, end quote. On the participants at the founding conference, historian Patrick Renshaw writes that they were not representative of the working class as a whole, but rather the radical elements of it. Quote, most of them came from unions that, for one reason or another, were at loggerheads with the AFL, American Federation of Labor. They were all radicals, and most of the leading personalities had been influenced by socialism of varying kinds, though this was often overlaid with syndicalism or anarchism. They shared a common conviction that the craft form of unionism represented by the AFL should be replaced by industrial organization, end quote. Consequently, the IWW represented an uneasy truce between militant unionists, anarchists, syndicalists, and party socialists, with Marxism a major influence. Much of their famous preamble paraphrases passages from Marx. Quote, tensions between revolutionaries and reformers manifested itself in countless disagreements over tactics, 
The most bitter of these within the ranks of the IWW itself involved those who urged the IWW to have a political arm and those who urged that the basic power of workers was at the point of production. End quote. The basic fault line was between those who wished for the IWW to be an economic organization linked to a separate political wing and those who argued for direct industrial action as the means of social and political change. The most notable of the former tendency was Daniel de Leon of the Socialist Labor Party, SLP, who wanted the IWW's industrial muscle to back the party's electoral ambitions. Opposing this view were the various shades of direct actionists, who argued that the political aims of the Union, enshrined in the preamble as including the, quote, abolition of the wage system, end quote, were best pursued on the industrial front, and thus that the IWW was both a political and an economic organization at the same time. This battle was settled in favor of the direct actionists in 1908, with the expulsion of the de Leonists. Subsequently, the IWW engaged in a series of high-profile free speech fights, confirming this attitude to pursuing political and social goals through direct action rather than recourse to party politics. The Wobblies, as they were known, grew in size and reputation off the back of several high-profile struggles, most notably the aforementioned free speech fights and the 1912 Lawrence Textile Strikes, where the IWW had only a few hundred members, but exerted great influence. But they found that membership tended to swell dramatically with struggles, and then ebb away. It's been said that, quote, Many a worker who did not carry the red membership card or had kept up dues payments was still to be counted a wobbly, end quote. The IWW was opposed on principle to the kind of incentives for member retention pursued by other mainstream unions, such as health or insurance benefits, and instead opted to deploy a job delegate system. This entailed traveling organizers authorized to collect dues and form union locals amongst the highly mobile, casual workforce of the early 20th century United States. Consequently, quote, a local could exist in the hat or satchel of a mobile delegate, end quote. This was an innovative model, and one which refused to succumb to the temptation to stabilize membership against the ebbs and flows of struggle with a host of member services. But it also brings to the fore a dual meaning of the term one big union. On the one hand, this meant one big union as opposed to many sectional unions. This conception was perfectly compatible with the ever-shifting membership of the IWW, and in fact made sense as casual workers could simply transfer from one industrial union to another within the IWW if they changed industries. However, the other interpretation was that one big union meant all, or at least a substantial proportion of, workers needed to be brought into the ranks of the union for the purposes of a revolutionary general strike and the transition to industrial democracy. Quote, the industrial unions would fight for gains within the existing system until the IWW was strong enough to call a general strike that would bring all economic activity to a standstill. The condition for returning to work would be the substitution of industrial unions for all business enterprises and governmental agencies. This means of production would then be run by the unions to satisfy social needs rather than private profit." End quote. The extent to which this was a literal aspiration or a revolutionary myth varies with the wobbly. Some WABs were unaware of the revolutionary aspect of the IWW when they joined, and the reality is that both interpretations coexisted within the IWW. What is clear is that the US government took the revolutionary threat of the IWW seriously enough to launch a brutal wave of repression. Between 1916 and 1918, dues-paying membership soared from 60,000 to 100,000, with influence extending for further than those numbers alone. This also gave the Wobblies a significant cultural influence on the wider working class. In 1917, Using damage to war production as the pretext, over 150 leading Wobblies were arrested, tried on spurious charges, and given long prison sentences. Union halls were raided by armed vigilantes, and shootouts ensued. Of course, only the Wobblies were arrested and sentenced to long jail terms were simply lynched, as in the case of Wesley Everest. The repression broke the IWW as a serious force, and the apparent success of the Communist Party in Russia led to a resurgent communist influence, which eventually split the declining organization in two in 1924. After a period of two rival IWWs, who at times fought in the streets for control of the HQ, the much weakened official IWW continued throughout the 1920s and 30s under increased anarchist influence, but as an increasingly fragmented and marginal force. Though as late as 1936, the IWW on the Philadelphia docks had the power to prevent a ship leaving with munitions for the Spanish fascists. It survived through the post-war period and remains active today. Finally, we turn to British syndicalism. The British context was somewhat different to elsewhere, as by the early 20th century, Britain had a mature industrial economy and a well-established trade union movement, which was soon to gain a parliamentary wing through the Labour Party. Consequently, 
The influence of French revolutionary syndicalism and American industrial unionism led to a different kind of syndicalist movement. Whereas French and American syndicalists and others had to endure harsh repression, in Britain, radical workers faced a different problem. Quote, Instead of undue repression, it was increasingly agreed, by the ruling class, that trade union demands could be more effectively diffused by bargaining, and in particular, by utilizing union officials as a mediating influence between labor and capital. Thus, British syndicalism emerged as a rank-and-file reaction against the recuperation of the existing labor movement into a mediating, representative role. In a sense, it was a rebellion of the associational function of unions against the representative one. Its idea of unionism was the workers united, as opposed to the bureaucratic apparatus of paid officials, legalism, and so on, which mediated this collective power. It was also fueled by the failings of the trade unions and the parliamentary socialists to defend workers' living conditions, as falling real wages, increasing unemployment, and de-skilling squeezed the working class. The great strategic debate in British cynicalism was between dual unionism, setting up independent revolutionary unions like in France or America, and Boring from within, building a rank-and-file movement which could take independent action as well as push to reform the existing bureaucratic unions in a syndicalist direction. In Britain, probably in large part because trade union membership was so much higher than elsewhere, the latter tendency won out. This tendency was exemplified by the prominent organizer Tom Mann, who had played a leading role in the 1889 London dock strike. Mann had emigrated to Australia to pursue electoral projects, but became disillusioned with the Labour Party and what he saw as the corrupting effects of government, as well as the sectional and divisive nature of the existing trade unions. He saw industrial unionism as the answer. In 1910, he visited French syndicalists and returned to England a convert. However, rather than set up new revolutionary unions, Mann proposed to reform the existing ones from within. Quote, I was thoroughly convinced that the economic struggle would ultimately be conducted through the trade unions, that however reactionary the unions might be at the hour, the only sensible policy would be to recognize them as the proper channels through which, sooner or later, the working class would have to function. So we declined to be identified with any policy that aimed at injuring the unions, but on the contrary, worked with might and main within their ranks to throw them on the right lines." End quote. Consequently, syndicalism in Britain did not take the form of separate revolutionary unions, but a radical rank-and-file presence in the existing unions. Numerically, syndicalists were a small minority, but the great labor unrest of 1910 to 1914 created an unparalleled platform for their ideas and their influence, particularly via the shop stewards movement, extended far beyond their own ranks. Indeed, quote, the facts that neither syndicalists nor syndicalism caused the labor unrest, and that in any event there were just not all that many syndicalists in Britain, have forced historians to make the awkward but perhaps unavoidable distinction between syndicalism proper, of which there was little, and a syndicalist mood and atmosphere for which a stronger case can be made." End quote. Consequently, British syndicalism was less a coherent organized force than a loose network of different tendencies, anarcho-syndicalists, militant shop stewards, socialists, whose influence extended far beyond its limited numbers. The only formally organized groups were small propaganda groups like the Industrial Syndicalist Education League, ISEL. As a result, British syndicalism operated more as a culture of direct action amongst the working class than an organized alternative to the TUC unions. Indeed, as Mann's quote suggests, there was often a surprisingly pro-TUC attitude insofar as syndicalists felt they could fill the unions with militant workers and reform them in a syndicalist, industrial unionist direction. This proved naive, and alongside repression, most famously in the syndicalist trials, quote, as important as the attack, isolation, and defeat of syndicalism was the fact that it was also partially co-opted, end quote. As some trade unions merged into industrial ones, syndicalists became sucked into union reform activities, which took their energies away from the shop floor. In this process, much of the radical political content was lost in favor of changes to the organizational structure of the unions. The syndicalist movement took different forms under different conditions. Everywhere is more than just a union, but also a wider culture within the working class. Quote, many workers regarded themselves as members without paying dues, end quote. Everywhere it was characterized by an advocacy of class militancy, unity, and direct action. The main strategic divide was between dual unionism and boring from within, with the latter approach being favored where unionization levels were already high through the established trade unions. Interestingly, in light of the renewed wave of casualization under neoliberalism, quote, in the occupational composition of syndicalist movements, two categories of workers were strongly represented. To the first category belonged casual, seasonal, or project laborers, whose working lives were characterized by forms of discontinuity, 
by episodic work periods, by frequent changes of employer, and often of work site, and sometimes of geographic locale as well." End quote. The second category is the structurally powerful miners and industrial workers, who perhaps make up the more enduring stereotype of union militancy. But it seems important today to note that syndicalism once thrived amongst casualized workers as well as more stable workforces. In terms of the political content of syndicalism, Marcel van der Linden and Wayne Thorpe write, quote, The ultimate ends of the syndicalist agenda were undeniably political. The abolition of the capitalist economic and political system, the establishment of a collectivist society structured on labor's economic associations, and the transfer of decision-making and administration to the producers, end quote. While many trade unions pay lip service to those same goals, what distinguishes syndicalism is its direct action methods, highly democratic structures, and minimal bureaucracy. And yet, these political goals were to be pursued by purely economic or apolitical organizations. In many cases, were they not smashed, they just opened the door to creeping reformism, co-option by political parties or the existing trade unions, and or outright class collaboration. The CGT's degeneration from a fighting workers association to a recruiting sergeant for imperialist war is the most striking example. This tendency would seem to confirm Malatesta's skepticism, but, as we will see, this is only partly the case. Despite its shortcomings, the syndicalist tradition is a rich and diverse one, for which anarcho-syndicalism belongs and owes much. We will pick this up in the following chapter. Marxism without a party? Council Communism Council Communism emerged in the early 20th century as a dissident current within Marxism, particularly in the Netherlands and Germany. Contrary to what the name might suggest, what distinguishes Council Communism from other traditions is not the advocacy of workers' councils. Anarchists, syndicalists, anarcho-syndicalists, and even Leninists favor a council system in some form. Rather, the council serves to distinguish the council communists from the party communists on a question central to Marxist revolutionary theory. Who should exercise the dictatorship of the proletariat, the communist party, or the workers' councils? Quote, state socialism is not control of the means of production by the workers, but control by the organs of the state. If it is democratic at the same time, this means that workers themselves may select their masters. By contrast, direct control of production by workers means that the employees direct the enterprises and construct the higher and central organizations from below. This is what is called the system of workers' councils, end quote. This is not to say the council communists abandoned political parties altogether. The most important of these was the German Communist Workers' Party, KAPD, formed in 1920 when they were expelled from the Communist Party. The KAPD styled itself as a different kind of political party, which would not seek power, but serve as the bearer of communist consciousness, in parallel to the factory organizations of the General Workers' Union of Germany, AAUD, which had been formed by workers breaking with the trade unions during unofficial strikes. The AAUD itself adopted a revolutionary program, including a hostility to political parties, with the exception of the KAPD. The KAPD and the AAUD therefore formed the political and economic wings of the Council Communist movement, respectively. Quote, the idea behind the relationship of the KAPD to the AAUD was that the factory organizations, operating as workers' councils for the social reorganization of production following the revolution, were to form the basis of the dictatorship of the proletariat. However, they could only fulfill this function insofar as those participating in them had a revolutionary and political concept of their tasks and functions, a communist consciousness. Insofar as this was not the case, the KAPD was conceived of as the separate organization of conscious communists, whose role was to promote communist perspectives and goals through its own independent activity and influence within the factory organizations." End quote. A co-thinker, and sometime member of the KAPD was the Dutch Marxist Anton Pannekoek. His book, Workers' Councils, remains one of the most widely read council communist texts, and was recently republished by anarchist publishers AK Press. Pannekoek acknowledges that the self-organized activity he advocates is indeed direct action. For Pannekoek, direct action takes place against both capital and the trade unions. In his view, the bureaucratic and inertial nature of the trade unions is a function simply of their size, Quote, the increase in the number of workers, the urgent necessity of association, make the trade unions giant organizations, needing an ever-increasing staff of officials and leaders. These develop into a bureaucracy administering all business, a ruling power over the members, because all the power factors are in their hands. End quote. He is explicitly referring to the trade unions rather than the syndicalist or anarcho-syndicalist unions, and his criticisms would not seem to apply so much to the latter, which typically sought to prevent bureaucracies emerging by rejecting paid officials and making all positions into mandated recallable delegates. 
In fact, Panacoke praises the IWW, although hoping it is a transitional form that will become unnecessary as workers begin to take direct action spontaneously. In place of trade union organization, Panacoke advocated spontaneous direct action, with workers forming and disbanding strike committees and factory councils as the struggle dictated. But in the tradition of deterministic Marxism, he linked this faith in spontaneity somewhat mechanically to the predicted ever-deepening crisis of capitalism. Quote, the depressing tendencies grow stronger under big capitalism, and so the resistance of the workers must grow stronger too. Economic crises grow more and more destructive and undermine apparently secured progress. The exploitation is intensified to retard the lowering of the profit rate for rapidly increasing capital. So again and again, the workers are provoked to resistance." End quote. Panacoke does not reject organization. In fact, he stresses the, quote, fight of the workers against capital is not possible without organization, end quote. However, quote, organization springs up spontaneously, immediately, end quote, not in the form of a new trade union, but through forms such as strike committees. This reliance on spontaneity and intermittent workplace organization is one of the main differences with the anarcho-syndicalist tradition, which we will explore in detail in the following chapter. However, Panacoke's analysis is problematic. If the strike committee is formed spontaneously, that implies the strike itself just happened. There may well be examples of such spontaneous strikes, but recent history does not support the idea that capitalist attacks make for spontaneous resistance. Rather, numerous factors come into play, such as the confidence and morale of the workers involved, their experiences of past struggles, the level of organization on the shop floor, and so on. The workplace organization of the AAUD was formed not to wage these everyday struggles, but to push for communism. Everyday struggles were left as a matter of spontaneity. Nonetheless, the council communism of the KAPD AAUD drew strong criticism from the party communists. Amadeo Bordiga wrote that, quote, the declaration of the left communists of Germany, KAPD, at their founding Congress in April, that they were founding a party, but not a party in the traditional sense of the word, is an ideological surrender to these reactionary views of syndicalism and industrialism, end quote. In a sense, Bordiga is right. However, from an anarcho-syndicalist perspective, a rejection of revolution as party dictatorship and an emphasis on the revolutionary power of workers organized at the point of production is not a retreat, but a significant advance on mainstream Marxism. And if Bordiga thought the KAPD and AAUD were surrendering to syndicalism, the founding of the AAUDE soon after went one step further. Otto Ruhl was expelled from the KAPD in October 1920 and took with him some sections of the party, which merged into the AAUD, forming the AAUDE, the E standing for unitary. Its program espoused hostility to parliament, political parties, and trade unions, banned paid officials, and advocated the international expropriation of capitalists to be managed by workers' councils. Whereas the KAPD AAUD had split the councilist movement into political and economic organizations, the AAUDE sought to serve as a unitary organization, one which merged the party into the factory organization and organized at the point of production. Rule was the leading theoretician of this tendency. His 1920 text, The Revolution is Not a Party Affair, attracted the ire of Lenin and set out an account of the revolutionary union as he saw it. Quote, the general workers' union is taking root in the factories, building itself up in branches of industry from the base up, federally at the base, and through revolutionary shop stewards at the top. It exerts pressure from the base up, from the working masses. It is built according to their needs. It is the flesh and the blood of the proletariat. The force that motivates it is the action of the masses. Its soul is the burning breath of the revolution. It is not the creation of some leaders. It is not a subtly altered construction. It is neither a political party with parliamentary chatter and paid hacks, nor a trade union. It is the revolutionary proletariat." End quote. While the influence of syndicalism is clear, there are a number of important differences. Firstly, the councilist unions rejected everyday struggles, leaving these to either reformist unions or spontaneous action by workers. This can be seen as a product of the time. Revolution seemed on the horizon, so all their energies were directed at that goal. But the reliance on spontaneity is distinct from the syndicalist stress on agitation and organization. Similarly, workers' struggles were only seen as being political on a mass scale, with widespread strikes and the possibility of revolution. But the meaning of politics for anarcho-syndicalists will be taken up in the next chapter. The move away from party politics to the shop floor also brought with it a very crude workerism, rejecting struggles outside the factories, with Rule writing that, quote, whenever the worker is seen outside the factory, he is a petty bourgeois, end quote. This contrasts sharply with the wider cultural, educational, and social elements of the syndicalist tradition. 
Second, the Council Communists saw their revolutionary unions as transitional organizations to be formed on the eve of revolution to make the final push for workers' councils and communism. This was pursued by either maintaining the dual political party economic union organization from mainstream Marxism, or in the case of the AAUDE, by a merger of party and factory organization into a unitary political economic organization. It was implicit that when the prospects of revolution receded, these organizations should disband and revert to more traditional Marxist forms. Indeed, the membership of the councilist groups dwindled from hundreds of thousands around 1920 to just hundreds by 1923. Similarly, the struggle up to this point was to be pursued by a more traditional reformist union revolutionary party pairing, with the party propagandizing against the limits of reformist unionism and for workers' councils. Summary in this chapter, we have encountered three radical currents in the workers' movement. Anarchism, the anti-state wing of socialism, cynicalism, a direct action union movement, and council communism, a dissident Marxist tradition which arrived at some similar political and organizational conclusions to anarchism and cynicalism. Broadly speaking, anarchism constitutes a political current, whereas syndicalism addresses itself to workers' shared economic interests. The latter sometimes left the door open for a creeping representative function and recuperation by the state. But that's not to say syndicalist currents, such as the IWW direct actionists, have not sought to make the political current more explicit, particularly in favoring unions as workers' associations for direct action, as opposed to representation. In a similar vein, Council Communism broke with the Marxist orthodoxy separating economic trade unions from the political party, and formed revolutionary unions. These also refused a representative role, insisting only workers' councils could express the interests of the working class. However, these were seen as a temporary formation on the eve of revolution, rather than the long-term organizing force within the working class favored by syndicalism. Further reading. On anarchism, the anarchist FAQ is the first port of call. It's a huge encyclopedic account of the numerous strands of anarchism and their relation to other currents, and debunks a lot of common myths. The first volume is available in print, edited by Ian McKay, and the web version is regularly updated. No Gods, No Masters by Daniel Guerin is also a highly regarded anthology. Units 5 through 12 of the self-ed history of anarcho-syndicalism cover the early history of syndicalism, including anarcho-syndicalism, around the world. In terms of syndicalism, there are several recommended books. Marcel van der Linden and Wayne Thorpe's edited volume Revolutionary Syndicalism is highly informative, as is Bob Holton's British Syndicalism 1900-1914. The Slow Burning Fuse by John Quayle also covers much of early British anarchism and syndicalism. In terms of council communism, there are several introductions available online which give an overview. An Introduction to Left Communism in Germany from 1914 to 1923 by Dave Graham is available on libcom.org and provides a good introduction. The Communist Left in Germany 1918 to 1921 by Gilles Devey and Denis Othier is also available in full online and provides a detailed account. Anton Panikok's Workers' Councils, was recently republished by AK Press with an introduction by Noam Chomsky and remains one of the clearest statements of council communism. Mark Shipway's Anti-Parliamentary Communism, the Movement of Workers' Councils in Britain 1917-1945, covers British councilist tendencies with some overlap with syndicalism and the shop stewards' movement. This has been a production of Audible Anarchist. You can find more Audible Anarchist on YouTube.